Coming up on Connects, later, columnist Knut Berger sounds off about the mayor, city politics, and the myth of Seattle Nice in his new book, Pugetopolis. Still ahead, the newest efforts in Olympia to balance the $6 billion budget gap, right now inside the mind of a con artist. Amid this economic crisis, a lot of people have watched their retirement and investments drop by thousands, even tens of thousands of dollars. It's tempting to want to make that money back quickly, especially if you're nearing retirement. But watch out. Con artists are out there ready to rip you off with seductive offers. Sabrina Registers shows us the common tactics they use and how you can spot them and avoid them. Money, money, money. Twenty dollars. That's all it took. Bob Johnson is now flooded with offers to play the lottery. This one is 785000 He sent in his $20 a few months ago when they said he had won. The $20 fee was to cover the expense of sending the big prize to him. But he never saw a penny of his so-called winnings. That's because the lotteries weren't real. Bob was scammed. They're pretty good, don't you think? They're good. They're excellent con artists. Who wouldn't want $1.2 million? And after all, $10 to send in to get it isn't very much. Doug Shadell at AARP says a growing number of Americans, especially older ones, get taken by the lottery scam. There are fraudulent operations sending hundreds of thousands of pieces of mail per month out um, all over the country. And they may only get 1% or 2% responding. But once you respond, then they will bombard you. Whether it's in the mail, on the phone, over the internet, or at your front door, con artists employ a number of tactics to try to get you to hand over your money. One of the tactics used is phantom fixation, getting you to believe something that isn't oh true. Three billion. In a lottery scam, a con artist will use phantom fixation when he or she will dangle huge amounts of money to get you to play along, like they did to Bob. That's almost a million. The offers are so compelling, victims ignore good judgment for a chance at the so-called grand prize. And the brochures and letters that arrive in the mail look very real. I remember a con artist telling me that if it weren't for the fact that state governments sponsored lotteries, we would never be able to pull off the lottery scam. Con artists also use another tactic we see everywhere, every day. One of the tactics that is really commonly used is we call, we call social proof. Everybody's doing this, jump on the bandwagon. These persuasion tactics that the con artists use, how are they different from the advertising and the marketing we see every day? Well, legitimate marketers use that. I mean, McDonald's has a sign that says billions and billions of hamburgers sold. There's nothing fraudulent about McDonald's, but that's the use of social proof in a legitimate operation. So it is hard to tell sometimes. Legitimate marketers, including the ones you see on TV, use a marketing tool called scarcity. You better hurry, because I'm told the cedar just sold out. You're made to think that if you don't act now, it will be gone for good and you'll lose a golden opportunity. But crooks also use the notion of scarcity to put pressure on you to act now. Now, John, back in 1860 from the Philadelphia Mint, there were 22,675 of these coins minted. Of those 22,000, only four have survived. Only four, for God's sakes. Just four remain at this grade. This criminal made a lot of money off of his victims. The coin was being sold to the victim for $3,100. The real value of the coin was about $300. Hollywood depicts con artists as rude, pushy, and intimidating. If you want to miss yet another opportunity here and watch your colleagues get rich doing clinical trials, then don't buy a share and hang up the phone. Well, hold on a second now. I didn't say that. I just want to talk about it some more. Really? Honestly, Doc, I don't have the time. But often, the scammer is more subtle in his approach. Take Bart Chamberlain, for example. He was a pro at using a tactic called source credibility to befriend his victims and gain their trust. Congratulations. You've walked away with the biggest award we've ever given away. Charlie Miller here, executive vice president of, of principal marketing. I want to congratulate you personally on your award. Mr. Jones, my last, my last name is Jones, too. I'm Mr. Robert Jones from Mobile, Alabama. I'll be coming out to your house personally to take photographs of you. So how is he using this to his advantage? This is trying to look bigger than you are. He's in a, on a cell phone in a hotel room, and he's using three different voices to make his company look like a big corporation. And he 
just changes his voice to be a bank president or to be the vice president of marketing. And this is what we're teaching people, is that it's very easy to fake source credibility. Bart even swindled victims out of $20,000 while he was behind bars. Mr. Jones, this is Jim O'Neill here. I'm calling you collect from down from the county jail. I'm down here this weekend doing my, my weekend warrior duty as a U.S. Marshal. The reason for the call and the, the urgency that necessitated I call you over the weekend collect is that I've spoken to our corporate headquarters out in New York and our accounting firm in Los Angeles. And it's my great pleasure to let you know that by next Tuesday or Wednesday, you will in fact receive your cashier's check for $225,000. Now, there is one final amount of business that I have confirmed through our general accounting office in Los Angeles. I want you to write this down. We are going to need you to go ahead and send out $20,000 to cover you for everything that, that prior to this point has been overlooked. So he's throwing out a lot of numbers there. Yeah, and source credibility. This is, again, the false use of source credibility. Our accounting office is in New York, our attorney in Los Angeles. And it sounds credible when really he's in an orange jumpsuit in a jail. So how can you protect yourself against these slick scammers? Shadell says be aware of the four persuasion tactics and have a plan. If you can see a persuasive attempt coming, you're much better able to defend against it. So first, here's what they look like. Secondly, if you're confronted with it, here's how you can get out of it without being rude. We teach people something called a refusal script. I'm sorry, but this is not a good time, and you hang up. These tactics aren't just the stuff of Hollywood movies. I'm successful to a point where I don't need to chase your business. They're real. Take it from this con artist. The three main things that I look for in looking at a potential investor is money, interest, and control. What seems like a benign activity, send 10 bucks in on a flyer, is not a benign activity because it's telling the con artist, you're somebody who participates in these types of scams compared to most people who do not. While he only lost $20, Bob learned the hard way about investment scams. Why they keep coming back to me, I don't know. Maybe because they've got my address and I'm at the, maybe I'm marked as a, as a potential something the con artist is banking on. The tactics Sabrina just showed you are all available in a book by AARP called Weapons of Fraud. You can get the book for free by calling the AARP Fraud Center at 1-800-646-2283. That's 1-800-646-2283. You don't be, need to be an AARP member to order a free copy.